Hi everybody, it's Martin from the Washboard Resonators. Now, we're stuck at home because of uh, the coronavirus right now. So we thought we'd make some videos, um, lessons, some historical kind of videos. This video is about the history of resonator instruments, in particular, nationals and dobros. But we'll look at the whole history from really the start until nowadays. It's a complex history, but an interesting history. Um, we're gonna look at millionaire playboys, Fender and Rickenbacker are in this story, um, Supro, Moserite, it's a fascinating tale. So let's get started. Okay, so the first time we see a resonator instrument, as we think of them now, is a patent in the UK in the 1860s, and you see a guitar that has inside the body a metal system that attaches to the bridge plate and then it's meant to vibrate and give the guitar more volume. The next time that we see something um, is 1901 in the UK again, Augustus Stroh. He's an inventor and a musical instrument maker. He makes violins with a kind of resonator on top and a horn is attached to it. And the idea is to get the violin louder, especially for recordings, and I've seen photographs where they've been used in the 1910s, the 1920s, uh, in recording sessions. Okay, so when it comes to nationals and dobro kind of instruments, our story begins in Slovakia in 1893. Um, Joseph and Catherine de Piera get married, and they kind of decide to emigrate to the US in 1910. They have um, ten children. And in Slovakia, Joseph has been working as a miller, he's been a, a craftsman, a woodworker, he's a violinist, and he's also a, uh, he's made some violins. And his children grow up around that kind of very practical and musical kind of upbringing. As time goes on, um, Joseph has a shop, and the children work there, in particular his son John Dopiera. Now, He's really the, 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 the key guy in this story. So John already uh, starts patenting um, picture frame making machines. He patents a design for a packing crate, but he's also been designing banjos and he's made his banjos louder and he's branded them national and he's painted them. This is around 1923. Let's look at some banjos now. Okay then, I have some banjos here. These are both from the 1920s, about the era we're talking. So the first one is one that you would think of as a typical kind of banjo of the time. It's got an open back. Um, as you play it, the, the sound kind of comes out both ways. This is um, a British-made banjo from the 1920s. This has what's called a resonator back on it. Now, it's not a resonator like we think of with these kind of instruments. It just means that the back is designed to throw the sound out. Now, the John Dopiera design was such that the resonator back was made out of metal. It attaches to the, the tone rings. And the idea was that as the head vibrates, the metal vibrates, and this metal bit on the back also vibrates. So not only pushing the sound forward, but also producing extra volume. So now we come to 1925, and some of his brothers are working with the family business. They've now got a real, you'd call it a music shop and a repair shop, and they're building instruments, they're repairing instruments. John's always trying to come up with better ways of doing things. And then a very interesting character, probably the second most important person in this story, enters the picture. This guy is George Beecham. And Beecham is a, um, a professional vaudevillian entertainer, a kind of cabaret musician, if you like. He plays lap guitar, like Hawaiian style guitar. He's with the William Morris Agency, a very prestigious agency, so he's probably doing quite well. And he comes along and he wants a louder instrument to compete with the orchestras in those kind of venues. So George and John work together and they produce instruments. The first one isn't very good, but the second one is basically what I'm holding here. This is um, a national resophonic tricone that is essentially the same design as what they came up with in 1926. Okay then, so you might be able to see under the cover 
some uh, cones. There are three resonating discs inside there that are attached by a bridge system. So those first tricone guitars are designed for Beecham to play Hawaiian guitar. So you play flat on your lap, some people call it lap steel or lap slide playing, and they're looking for a sound that is rich but also sustains for a long time. Now let's look at how the resonator system in a guitar works. It's one of these. This is my gramophone, and basically this is what these instruments are. So you've got a, um, a record spinning, there's a needle that's attached to a, a metal, I don't know if you can see that, a metal part. That picks up the vibrations. This little metal disc that's in this, this hole here, it um, vibrates and produces a sound, and then the horn section amplifies it and throws it out. So that is exactly the same as one of these guitars. Think about the strings vibrating, think about that as a record spinning. Then think about the little um, needle is kind of the bridge section, picking up those frequencies. Then think about the little metal disc as the big resonator cone in the guitar. And then think about the horn as being like the body. I think we should demonstrate. <laughs> So this is the kind of guitar that most people back then would have used. It's a smaller body, wood body guitar. This is an 1899 um, Washburn, but you, you'll get the idea. And these kind of guitars sound beautiful, but they're kind of quiet and sort of pleasant sounding. Let's compare that to a resonator guitar. is that the National is very loud and the voice of it is much more voiced towards middle frequencies and they're the frequencies that will cut through. So you think about jazz orchestras, you think about the reed sections or drum kits or you think about um, Hawaiian music and, and that Hawaiian guitar needing to be really on top of the sound of the rest of the band. These instruments have got what it takes to kind of get the guitarist heard. Okay, so it's a family affair. Um, brother Rudolf is helping do the metal work on these first guitars. Um, there's Carl and Paul Barth, who are um, nephews, and they're helping build stuff. Um, John's doing woodwork and inventing. I think that George and John realise they've got something and maybe they can capitalise on it and it can be a success. So the next part of the story is how the company gets going. So George is kind of responsible for this. I think as a musician and an entertainer, he sees an opportunity and he capitalises. So he decides to try and get funding to set up a factory. And the way that he does this is he throws a party for the rich and famous in Los Angeles and he employs probably the world's leading Hawaiian guitar player, a man called Sol Hoopy. And Sol plays the tricone and by the end of the party, um, Beecham has a cheque for twelve and a half thousand dollars. So that cheque comes from a man called Ted Kleinmeier. And Ted Kleinmeier is um, an interesting character. He is, um, in his early twenties, he has inherited one million dollars and he um, expects to inherit another million dollars by the age of 30. Now, let's put these figures into context. I'm filming this in uh, 2020. Uh, in today's money, that $1 million equates to about $15 million in today's money. And that check for $12,500 to start at the company is about $185,000. So on April the 9th, 1927, they officially register a patent for a tricone guitar. And this is where um, the Rickenbacker connection comes in. So a man called Adolf Rickenbacker, he is an instrument builder and he's an engineer. And he helps National set up 
tooling, dyes, presses, machines, to be able to produce these kind of guitars in a, in a factory setting rather than just literally hand beating them out of bits of metal and f forming them that way. Now on the subject of Adolf Rickenbacker, it's interesting to note that Beecham later on designs the, probably the first true electric guitar that's successful, a Rickenbacker lap steel with Rickenbacker. Also, Beecham as a musician is friends with a guy called Doc Kaufman. And Doc Kaufman is um, later on in the 40s, is Leo Fender's um, first partner. They produce lap steels and uh, amplifiers together. Also, Kaufman is the guy that does the noise on the Looney Tunes records. Okay, so National are now selling guitars to professional musicians. They're in demand. Um, a style one, so the basic model Tricone sold for about $125. In 2020 money, that's about $1,800. Um, so these are professional grade instruments. You're really, you know, paying good money for these. And they're looking for a way to produce guitars that are maybe a bit more affordable. And this is where you really start to see Beecham and John Dopiera's relationship break down. So in 1927, um, Beecham is photographed in a music magazine holding a tricone, and it says, George Beecham, the inventor of this instrument. And that really annoys John. And then, as they're looking to produce a cheaper instrument, um, John designs a single cone system, but he doesn't like the sound of it, so he doesn't want that out there. Beecham does, because he knows it's a cheaper instrument. So they invent a model called a triolian. Okay, so here is my 1931 triolian. Now this is a single cone guitar with a steel body. If we work backwards, the models before this were um, a single cone with a wood body. But when these were conceived, they were conceived as a wood body with a... Um, more basic cover plate like this, but a three cone system underneath, hence the name Triolian. It was meant to be a three cone system. So it's around 1928, when those first Triolians came out, that John Dopiera essentially leaves the company. There's a board meeting and he storms out. So now there's a split. National carry on producing instruments and growing year on year, and John goes off and forms a company called Dobro. So here is a Dobro. This is a 1930s one. And Dobro is an interesting company. So there are the brothers, Rudy, Emil, Lewis and John over there. They're working out of, um, I think it was like a back room of the people that did the, the, the chrome plating on the, the guitars. The name Dobro has a double meaning. The first part, the D-O, is for the Dopiera brothers. The bro part, B-R-O, is the brothers. And then it also means in um, kind of um, Baltic languages, um, good. So how is a Dobro system different? So on a national, the cones sit kind of this way. And we call those biscuit bridges because the little piece of wood where the bridge is is like a little dark brown round thing. Biscuit bridge. This is what people call a spider bridge. So on a Dobro, the cone sits upside down and it attaches with, um, it's like a cast thing that looks a little bit like a spider's web. And the whole thing vibrates, produces a very nice sound. So Dobro patent their resonator system. They produce resonators. Beecham and National sue Dobro, but they lose. There is no copyright infringement, it's a different system, and National have quite a big competitor on their hands. So now, it gets really messy. Beecham starts going around and slandering Dobro, 
but also claiming weird things to do with him having the, the, the copyright of certain designs, which are in John's name. So now Dogro countersue against all that, and it gets messy. It looks like um, National could be forced to have a really big financial problem on their hands. Beecham is let go from National, and time moves on. And because of um, some of the Dopieri brothers having stocks and a controlling interest in National, and I think owning the, um, the, the copyright to the name National, a deal is struck where Dobro and National are formed to be the same company. It seems like the best way of going forwards. So now we move on and Dobro's and Nationals are being made in the same factories and um, the Dopieri brothers are back in charge. So we are moving into the middle 1930s and it's an interesting time. So National are producing big quantities of instruments um, mostly kind of, kind of cheaper instruments. So here's a good example. This is their cheapest model. It's a National Trojan. And this, they produce these by the thousands. They would get um, the bodies and the necks made in Chicago uh, by companies like K, quite cheaply. They would then have them shipped to Los Angeles and they would put them together and sell them. This would sell for about 30 some dollars. Um, back then, which would relate to about probably $600 in today's money. Um, one of their other very popular guitars, I think, I could be wrong, but I think one of their biggest sellers, or the biggest seller, was the Juolian model. Now these are wonderful. These, even though these were quite a cheap model, they're made out of very thin steel and they sound incredible. <laughs> Around this time, they are producing lots of stuff. So, ukuleles, mandolins, guitars, plectrum guitars, all kinds of things. And in 35, they sold $600,000 worth of stock. So, in today's money, maybe 11 million. So that, that's quite a lot of stuff. Now, we looked at the price of a tricone. We looked at a Trojan, the cheap model. If a Trojan was $35, their mid-model was a Stylo. This is from 1934. These sold for um, about $85 back then, which is, I think, about $1,200 in today's money. And if you wanted to get really fancy, um, we know that a Style 1 Tricone was $125-ish. Um, a Style 4 was their fanciest. That would have all kinds of engravings on it. Um, they were about $200, which is around $3,000 in today's money. So, time moves on. National moved to Chicago because it's the centre of instrument manufacture. And the musical landscape is changing. Electric guitars are becoming very popular. Um, there'd been a... Um, a big civil works to put electricity into every corner of um, America through the 30s as a kind of economic stimulus because of the Great Depression. So electric guitars are starting to take off and Nationals start producing electric guitars. Now I don't have any Nationals, I've got, I've got an old Kalamazoo Gibson here to give an idea, an arch top with a pickup, but these kind of things are becoming really popular and National is trying to compete they don't really get the market share, and resonators are kind of falling out of favour. They're not as needed, and there's probably a lot of them around secondhand, so their business starts to struggle as we go through the later 30s. So to try and keep up, they produce cheaper instruments that go into um, catalogues and things like that, but they're starting to struggle. By 1941, CMI, a big musical company, by National, um, they keep producing and then World War II hits and there's a change. So National have a factory and there are now contracts being handed out by the US government to be able to produce things for the war effort. So to try and capitalise on that, 
and get a contract, some of the national management buy the company out. So let me get this correct now. We have Vic Smith, Al Frost, Luis Del Piero, V-A-L. They produce a company called Valco and they produce airplane parts. Then after the war, they go back to guitar manufacture. Now, we will all have seen and heard of some of their products. So Valco produced things like Supra. They're still producing Nationals, but some, some weird ones are these Nationals that you'll see like Jack White playing with the, the, uh, the plastic bodies. And um, they're quite successful producing lower mid-level kind of stuff. So that could be the end of resonators as we know them. But I think bluegrass bands would use Dobros as a lap style thing and there is a market for them. So this is where the story continues. So two of the brothers, Rudy and Emil, start a new company, OMI. So that's in 1967. They start producing Dobro-esque resonator guitars. And in 1970, they managed to buy back the name Dobro. So we're back to having um, Dopiero Brothers owning the Dobro brand. They produce guitars. Now, I'm not an expert on these, but I've heard from people that the quality could be up and down. I don't know. Um, but they keep going. They have a hound dog brand and they sell to Gibson in 1993. You might walk into a, a, a store today with a Dobro resonator on the wall, uh, like a Far East produced guitar. Okay, so we can really finish up now. So um, let's just talk about other things that have happened in more recent times to get us to where we are today. So it's worth looking at what the scene was like if you wanted a resonator instrument through the 70s, the 1980s, the 1990s. So from what I understand from people that I've bought instruments from, they tell me that resonators then were really expensive because you could only really buy old ones or these OMI ones and Supply and demand meant the old ones were actually pretty expensive, even more so than now, even counting like inflation, they were very expensive. And there was interest in them. So in parallel lines, a few companies started to spring up, trying to reproduce the golden days of these beautiful old instruments. So I'm sitting in Leeds in Yorkshire in England, and where I am is where there's a little bit of this story. There's a company called Beltona, um, Steve Evans and Bill Johnson. I believe, could be wrong, but I believe that they were basically the first guys to start producing a quality metal body and manufacturing a decent standard instrument. Now, I know that Mark Knopfler and Eric Clapton have played these instruments and they were based very nearby um, in Bradford, but now um, Steve Evans is about 20 minutes in that direction and he um, he looks after all my instruments and builds fantastic instruments and works on wonderful stuff. There's also Continental that starts up in the 90s. I think they're German. They're producing quality, really nice metal resonators. So here I have a National. Here I have a National Resophonic. Let's find out what that's all about. That involves a man called Don Young. Now Don Young worked for OMI and he's trying to make a better instrument. He's a fan of the music, of the guitars and of the production and he can't get anywhere to produce a better thing. So he decides I'm going to start up on my own. So around 1988 him and his buddy McGregor Gaines they start up National Resophonic. So National Resophonic start producing um, wood bodies, then they tool up for steel bodies, and then by about 1993 they're producing um, brass bodies. Um, this is my 2004 National Resophonic that I gig with all the time. So here we are in 2020. What does the resonator world look like now? Well, I think it's never looked better. There are products at all price ranges and 
incredibly high quality ones that I dare say surpass the quality of the old nationals. So this bit of the video is the bit that I found the hardest to kind of figure out and I'm certain I'm going to miss people that are really important that have escaped my mind. But um, if we're looking at the high end stuff, then I think National Resophonic and um, Shearhorn and Beard and um, Beltona, Fine Resophonic are amazing, Mule, fantastic. These people are producing really high quality guitars that are as good as it gets. There's a range called Michael Messer and they are the perfect in between in that they are Far East made but to really good quality control. They're set up in the UK and those are fantastic. I've played quite a few of those and they sound good, they play good and um, they're very affordable. There are instruments that are made um, in the Far East in about one or two factories that are then branded differently. Now there are so many of those, I've actually got a list. Um, I'm sure you've seen them in your local guitar shops, but um, Regal, Ozark, Johnson, Vintage, uh, Recording King, Ashbury, Stag, Gretsch, Dobro, Dean, Rogue, Hutchins, Busker, Tanglewood, Gold Tone, Epiphone, Republic, and you know, I've played sort of all of these. Some of them are really, really, really nice. Um, some of them less so. Like any resonator, they can be hit or miss. It de really depends on the um, the uh, the setup. But also, the old ones can be kind of sourced through Reverb and eBay kind of easily. Okay then, so if you want to find out more about resonator instruments, there are loads of places to do it. Um, there's some good Facebook pages. Um, there's a great forum by Michael Messer. Um, hashtags on Instagram are really good. Um, get in touch with us. Um, pretty much every gig I end up speaking to somebody about resonator guitars, which is part of the reason why we've made this video. Um, there are some books as well. So this is the um, Brosman book. I've heard some, um, some stories, but uh, it's, it's an interesting book with a good part of the story in it. Um, this is my favourite book for resonator instruments. This is by Mark Makin, who I think is the, um, the authority on these kind of things. And this is incredible because what he's done, he's taken his um, graphic design skills and produced graphics of every variant and I don't know if you can see but there are so many little tiny variants on these things it's it's incredible um, it's got everything in it you'd ever need to know and more so thank you if you've made it this far um, I hope you found it interesting I found this quite hard to make I, I didn't want to make videos like this but we're on lockdown, so let's share some information. Um, now, um, if you want to help out, then um, subscribe to the Washboard Resonators below. Find us on Instagram and Facebook. Um, like, comment, it all gives better algorithms and more people see our stuff and it's free. Come to a gig, buy a t-shirt or a CD, that would be fantastic. Or just get in touch and email, we, we love chatting. So uh, thank you very much everybody and um, see you all soon.